Welcome to Jobbed Out, the wrestling editorial that reminds you that Vince McMahon once wanted to put a blue dot over the face of a future Hall of Famer. Let's go back to 2005 for a little bit today. We are smack dab in the middle of a brand split and SmackDown is absolutely killing it in terms of match quality. They had so many of the best names putting on clinics night after night with JBL and John Cena, Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio. The blue brand was fun as hell to watch. Now Raw? Raw had a lot of great talent too, but... If I told you the main event of Raw's pay-per-view was Batista vs. Triple H, your only valid response is, which time? Between WrestleMania and SummerSlam, those two would main event pay-per-views for the World Heavyweight title three times. Clearly, Raw needed to shake things up and get some new stars on the red brand. Cena and Batista swapped places and we began to see some fresher matchups. Big Match John would defend his title against HBK, against Kurt Angle, against Chris Jericho, and of course, the subject of today's video, Christian. Christian had been a consistently awesome performer at this point in his career, stringing together a lot of moments and titles over the better part of a decade, but for one reason or another, Vince McMahon just did not want to pull the trigger and try him out. Maybe it's because he's 6'1", or maybe because he's 221 pounds with bricks in his pocket. Maybe it's the blue dot worthy face. Vince was more content with Christian having tantrums in the center of the ring than being a credible threat. Then. Christian decided to reinvent himself. He changed his look, he became Captain Charisma, and fans started to get on board. Despite that interest from fans, McMahon just would not give Christian the chance like he had with Eddie or Jericho or HBK, all of whom are of Christian's size or smaller. Even Jeff Hardy got more of a sniff at the top by this point, and he was billed as the same height and weight as Christian. So anyway, on October 31st, 2005, Christian's contract expired. He refused to sign a new deal, worked Raw, worked SmackDown, said his goodbyes, and walked away from the WWE. Only nine days, not 90, nine days after his final SmackDown appearance, Christian set foot in the Impact Zone. Now nobody's gonna pretend TNA is on par with WWE, even at this point. But they had regular pay-per-views, they had weekly TV, they had a loyal, knowledgeable fan base, and they were really starting to gather those names. Christian's mission statement was simple. I've come to TNA to take the one thing that's eluded me my entire career. The NWA World Heavyweight Championship! That's his goal! Prove to the powers that be that Christian Cage can be a main event player. And look at the names he had to work with on this roster, old and new. So many options, so many new matches, even dream matchups, as Christian aimed to reinvent and prove himself. It would be only three months before he took on the King of the Mountain for the NWA World Heavyweight title. And that brings us to... Today in Wrestling History! February 12th, 2006, TNA presents Against All Odds. Its main event? Christian Cage taking on Jeff Jarrett in a bout that can only be described as a very Jeff Jarrett kind of match. At this point... We're quite a ways into TNA's version of the Reign of Terror, with Jared either challenging or holding the top title seemingly every second show. His matches were standard late WCW overbooking. Ref bumps, interference, guitar shots, and calamity that often left fans feeling underwhelmed. Perhaps because history had shown that even if somebody usurped Jarrett, he would just get his win back almost right away. In 2005 alone, Jarrett disposed of Monty Brown, Kevin Nash, DDP, and Rhino, all in NWA Heavyweight World Title matches. But tonight? Tonight was going to be different. Instead of Jarrett trying to show the world that he can hang with proven top guys from other companies, this time the match was going to be about someone else proving they could hang with Jarrett. Now I'm not going to lie, even though this was very much a Jeff Jarrett match, it was a pretty damn good Jeff Jarrett match. Maybe it's because he had a younger, more physically able opponent in his own weight class. Maybe it's because I'm used to Christian being cannon fodder. I mean, even the matches where they would give him plenty of time, it was because he's in a tag match. The WWE just did not want to give Christian 15 or 20 minutes a night to prove himself. But this match, yeah. We got to see some creative use of the environment, some high impact moves, pardon the pun, actual storytelling. But of course, because it's TNA, 
a ton of interference from an unlikely participant. You know, in 20 years, I'm not sure I have one single other memory of Gale Kim working heel. Huh. Anyway. This match also gave us an obligatory Montreal Screwjob reference. Christian Cage hooked onto the ankle of Ripley oh, oh, no, no, Don't you dare! Don't you dare do it! Don't you dare do it! Don't you dare do it! And began showing us that the most important new trait Christian has is that he's smart. You see, by default, bigger wrestlers are kind of just viewed to be stronger. Smaller wrestlers, faster. But Christian Cage's whole thing here was that he's been around and he knows how to think on his feet. So if interference was coming along, he'd adapt. If Gail Kim tried to take liberties, he'd counter her. And the fans ate it all up. At one point, they even chanted, Fire Kim. Uh, like I said, I smelled her right at the beginning. Nice kick. And to think, the only person who actually did fire her was Johnny Ace. So after powerbombing Gail Kim to a gigantic pop and countering Jarrett's finisher into his own, Christian Cage got the 1-2-3, claiming his first of two NWA World Heavyweight Championships. He would lose the belt back to Jarrett in a King of the Mountain match four months later, but he'd remain undefeated in one-on-one -on -one bouts until nine months afterwards. Shortly after that, he would claim a second NWA Heavyweight title and hold on to it until the day the NWA and TNA split up. In the grand scheme though, how did this all turn out? Christian would stay with TNA until the end of 2008 before re-signing with the WWE. He was originally penned a feud with Jeff Hardy, but once news of that got out, Christian was sentenced to 12 months hard labor in ECW on Sci-Fi. He would claim an ECW world title, twice in fact, alongside two World Heavyweight Championships, albeit in less than spectacular fashion, and probably only because Edge was forced to retire instead of his own merits. Christian would appear one more time with TNA afterwards as part of a talent exchange so that Ric Flair could attend the WWE Hall of Fame, but that is a story for another time. Ultimately, Christian seemed quite unhappy with his TNA run, which is a real shame because he got a chance to shine there. When he did return to WWE, he basically picked up where he left off in October of 2005, which is also a damn shame because his whole goal was to prove that he could be more than that. But if Vince sees you one way, there's just no convincing him otherwise. Sorry, peeps. So with all that said and done, I do want to ask you, what did you think of Christian Cage when he jumped ship from the WWE to TNA? Was it the right move? And do you think the NWA world title helped raise his stock? Or if he had stayed in the WWE, would he have gotten to the same heights regardless? Let me know what you think in the comments and be sure to subscribe to the channel for more because I want you to be a part of the conversation too. For now though, I better get my shoulders off the mat, so I want to thank you for tuning in to Jobbed Out. I'll catch you next time.